As the bombs continue to fall on Aleppo, what is Iran's endgame in Syria? I'll ask the country's vice president, Masume Ebtikar. I'm Mehdi Hassan, one of the world's best-known public intellectuals. The Marxist writer Slavoj Žižek thinks the left has romanticized refugees and glossed over the many problems they cause. I'll challenge him in the arena. But first, a Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, continues his bombardment of East Aleppo. What role is Iran playing in arming and funding his regime? And does the Iranian government bear responsibility for alleged war crimes in Syria? This week's headliner from Tehran, Iran's vice president and head of the country's environmental protection organization, Masume Ebtikar. Madam Vice President, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, when Egyptians rose up against Mubarak, Iran supported them. When Libyans rose up against Gaddafi, Iran supported them. When the Bahrainis took to the streets against their royal family, uh, Iran supported them. But in Syria, when the people rose up there, you helped President Assad kill them. Why? Why can't Syrian revolutionaries get the same support from Iran that Egyptians, Libyans and Bahrainis have? I think that in all these cases, ultimately, the people have to decide. About Syria, no group, no country has the right to decide for the people of Syria. It's ultimately the people who decide for their future, and I think that it should be that way for the people of Syria. Unfortunately, we have terrorist groups. We have certain foreign powers arming terrorist groups inside that country, and that has been aggravating the situation in the past years, and this is something that has to be addressed. Uh, of course, um, I think the international community is now more and more realizing uh, the situation, and uh, I think that the people of Syria should be supported in terms of their struggle against terrorism, and that ultimately a internal dialogue should gain momentum, and that internal dialogue can bring about peace and stability in that country. I think it's only for the people of Syria to decide their fate. I think we all uh, would agree on the fate and on peace and stability. You mentioned foreign powers supporting uh, groups on the ground, and I'm, many would agree with you about rebels being supported by outside powers. But more than 400,000 people are dead in Syria, according to the UN. The vast majority of them killed by the Syrian government, not by quote-unquote terrorists. And that government has been armed funded and militarily supported by Tehran from day one? These are certain allegations. Uh, of course, I, I couldn't. The government of Iran does not agree with many of them, but the important thing is But you do, is that you do give money to Assad and you do give weapons to Assad? Terrorists are now intervening for several years now in the internal affairs of that country. And as I mentioned, it's for the people to decide their fate. It's for... Uh, the foreign powers to assist them to come to an internal dialogue for peace and for a democratic process that would ensure uh, a peaceful resolution of these conflicts. But, Madam Vice President, the world has looked on in horror at some of the images coming out of East Aleppo. People barrel-bombed, children hit with chlorine gas. Bashar al-Assad may laugh away those images and say all of those kids are terrorists, but surely you uh, are not going to say that today. Surely those images must bother you as a parent, as a human being, when you see those images of kids being bombed in East Aleppo. Those images, exact. those images, I see those images and they bother me. I see those images in Yemen and what is happening in Yemen and there's a deafening silence in most mainstream media, including your media, about Yemen. Why, why do we have double standards? Uh, uh, similar issues are happening in parts of Palestine. I think we've covered, on this show, we've covered Yemen and Palestine. Right now we're talking about Syria and Iran's role in Syria. If you want to criticize Saudi Arabia's role in Yemen, why not criticize your own government's role in Syria? Barrel bombs are dropping on people in East Aleppo. You support, I've never heard an Iranian official cr criticize the use of barrel bombs in Aleppo. Will you do that today, Madam Vice President? As I mentioned, as I mentioned, we have to put double standards away. We all agree on double standards. Will you condemn the use of barrel bombs in East Aleppo against children, not against terrorists, against children? You said those images bother you. Will you condemn the causes of those images? The reality is that we have to condemn 
we have to condemn such acts when they happen anywhere. But uh, unfortunately, what is happening now in Syria is that the terrorists are being supported. They are creating violence. They are acting. Madam Vice President, the majority situation. of people killed He's in Syria, by, according to every independent clear. group, have been killed by the Assad government, which Iran arms, funds, and supports. This is your analysis. That's the UN Other analysis. Independent groups don't believe in this analysis. They believe that the intervention of terrorist groups is a major issue. So I think that we have to go back to the basics. The basics is that the people of Syria have to decide for their future. Foreign intervention, foreign terrorists, they have to be left out of the picture. The Syrian people have to get together, negotiations and dialogue for peace and stability in their country and in their region. Uh, one final question on Syria before we move on. You've accused uh, many outside powers of arming quote-unquote terrorist groups uh, in Syria. Many Western governments would agree with you. Many analysts would agree with you. But Iran supports Houthi fighters in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon and in Syria. It sends foreign fighters from across the world, from as far afield as Afghanistan, Shia fighters, into Syria to prop up a government that represents a minority Alawite population. Many would say that you're interfering in Syria. You're sending in quote-unquote terrorists. You're contributing to sectarianism in that country. As much as any other foreign power, these if not are, more so. Yeah, these are allegations. Does the, Iran not support Hezbollah? The, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran does support, particularly the spiritual support. Iran is emerging as a power which is promoting peace and stability in this region. Not in Syria, where you're supporting groups on the ground who are committing, according to groups, war crimes, according to human rights groups. That may be, that may be, that may be your Not analysis. my version, Madam Vice President. Our Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, working. the United Nations. Our version, our version has been that we've, we've been trying and working with different groups to promote peace and stability in uh, Yemen, in Syria, in Palestine, in uh, our neighbors in Iraq, in Afghanistan. We've been working against terrorist groups, but terrorist groups have been funded by different foreign powers, and unfortunately, there's been very little said about where this funding is coming from, where is Daesh being supported, both politically, but also in terms of the funds, in terms of the arms, where are all those arms coming? It's a very good point you raise, and I've raised it with uh, governments from across the region. I've got you here today in front of me. Just before we move on, just to clarify on Syria, does Iran support Hezbollah, a foreign fighting force in Syria? Hezbollah is a foreign force on the ground in Syria. Does Iran as support I that force? As I mentioned, we support the expulsion of terrorists of terrorist groups. Is Hezbollah on the ground in Syria supported by Iran? Very simple, Madam Vice President. Yes or no? Only the people only the people of Syria have the right to decide for their future and their destiny. Okay, uh, just closer to home. You're in charge of yes. the environment for the Iranian government. That's your portfolio. Like most other nations, Iran signed the Paris Agreement to tackle climate change last year. If the US under Donald Trump walks away from that agreement, does it automatically collapse or can the Paris climate deal survive uh, the US withdrawing from it? No, it shouldn't automatically collapse because uh, the countries are already uh, uh, implementing the Paris Agreement. They have uh, not only um, the entry into force of the uh, Paris Agreement has already happened. That means that more than 55 percent of the countries and 55 percent of the commitments have already been realized. So I think that this is a real deal and I think that the countries uh, in the world have committed themselves not only in talk and uh, in writing but also in action and we, we see a lot of new initiatives in uh, the Marrakesh talks. There were a lot of uh, new ideas coming up, coalitions, partnerships between countries, regional partnerships. I think that this is an important instrument for uh, regional cooperation and uh, uh, working um, on this issue can help to bring about regional coalitions and 
in a region which uh, many of our uh, relationships are politicized, I think that we need to work with not only our neighbors, but with uh, um, all countries, our, um, our Arab neighbors, um, because we, the environmental challenges that we face, uh, these are issues that we need to work together. We need to get into partnerships. We live in one region, and we have a common future. So I think that this is one area where we can put aside the differences and work together. Do you think countries in the Middle East, do you think the Muslim majority world uh, came late to the climate change debate? Did they not take it seriously enough at the beginning and now they're playing catch up? Do you think they've done enough? Yes, yes. I think that you're very right on that issue and I think that uh, they came late. Uh, they, they didn't grasp the uh, uh, reality or the severity of uh, the issues coming, but now I think that they're uh, more and more uh, realizing uh, how important it is and they're integrating these uh, issues into their uh, national plans and for that reason I think that it's very important that we work together. I think that in Iran we have a, uh, a very strong uh, uh, national body on this issue. We have a lot of capacity building in our different sectors and I think that we're prepared to work with many many of our neighbors in the region in terms of working for enhancing capacity and also working together partnerships both private sector and public sector initiatives are very important uh, in this area and I think that we have to work together and Iran is open to uh, working with its neighbors with its regional uh, partners on this issue. Madam Vice President, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. Everyone loves Aung San Suu Kyi, once held as a political prisoner by a brutal military dictatorship, but now the de facto leader of democratic Myanmar, also known as Burma. She's captured the hearts of leaders across the globe. Barack Obama recently removed an array of economic sanctions on her Southeast Asian nation. So with such an esteemed Nobel Peace Laureate now in charge, things are surely looking up for the people of Myanmar. Well, not all of them. Certainly not the Rohingya Muslims who live in that country, victims of ethnic cleansing and maybe even genocide. Yes, for years, the Rohingya of Myanmar have lived basically as an underclass, most of them stateless. They've been terrorized by groups of violent Buddhists who wrongly labeled them illegal Bengali immigrants, and more than 120,000 of them have been forced into camps. The government doesn't even recognize the name Rohingya. But you know who else doesn't recognize the Rohingya? That's right, Aung San Suu Kyi. Not not only was she accused of cowardice for refusing to call them by their name and criticized by the Dalai Lama, among others, but she since demanded that the US government not use the name Rohingya either. And in a remarkable 2013 interview with the BBC's Michal Hussein, Suu Kyi refused to condemn the systematic violence against the Rohingya, that same violence that the UN Special Rapporteur has said could amount to crimes against humanity. Muslims have been targeted, but also Buddhists have been uh, subjected to violence. But there's fear on both sides. Both sides! Last time I checked, it wasn't Burmese Buddhists who were being confined to camps where they were slowly succumbing to starvation, despair and disease. And it wasn't Buddhists who were raped by soldiers at gunpoint during the violence that flared in Rakhine this October. Incidentally, it was later reported that Suu Kyi left that BBC interview muttering, no one told me I was going to be interviewed by a Muslim. Charming. Now, defenders of Suu Kyi argue that her hands are tied by an all-powerful military elite. They also point to the new advisory commission her government set up, chaired by Kofi Annan, no less, and basically tasked with ending the violence and promoting peace. But here's the thing, some local politicians are already refusing to cooperate with it. And while Anand can give recommendations, his commission has no power to enforce those recommendations. As part of her struggle against her country's military rulers, Aung San Suu Kyi spent 15 years in detention. 15 years waiting for justice. Now she's in power, how many years will she make the Rohingya wait for justice? He's been called the most dangerous philosopher in the West. And in his new book, Refugees, Terror and Other Troubles with the Neighbours, Slavoj Žižek calls for a defense of the European Enlightenment project and rails against the romanticization of refugees. So I began by asking why he thinks refugees pose such a threat to so-called European values. First, I was very specific what I mean by European 
Enlightenment project. And let me draw my attention to what I also yep. say in this book. This that book? Yep. The greatest threat to Europe today are not the refugees. The greatest threat are precisely the fake right-wing populist defenders of Europe. For me, a true threat to Europe is people like Nigel Farage, Marine Le Pen, mm. uh, Pegida in Germany come to power. You say refugees come from a culture that is incompatible with Western European notions of human rights. Uh, I wonder if I said this precisely. You said it precisely on page 107 of your book. What do I say? You say refugees come from a culture that is incompatible with Western European notions of human rights. Yeah, but a couple of pages later or before, okay. I don't know where, I also say that I'm well aware that European notion of human rights is not a is not above in the air universal so one. Why, so why make such a big play out of refugees threatening it then? I explicitly, brutally, that's the whole first third of the yep. book, emphasize that refugees are, to a large extent, mainly responsibility of European geopolitical gains played there in Libya, in the Middle East, of uh, new economic forms of neocolonialism, and so on and so on. So we, but not only we, also, United States and other countries, we cannot play the game of, oh, yep. a catastrophe happened there, now we have a purely oh. humanitarian problem. That, I make so it clear. So that is a fairly uncontroversial position. And yeah. then you move oh. on to the controversial position, yeah, which, which is? is you which is, okay, that's I explicitly say in the book. I want even more refugees. I only want rules to be clearly established, not the rules in the sense of refugees have to pass the test of fitting at the West and so on and so on. But okay, I will give you a vulgar example. Don't tell me it's a marginal one. I okay. mentioned in the book, it happens over, I was so told, by leftist reports, over 2,000 times per year in Germany. You have all my respect to them, a uh, Muslim family of refugees in Germany. What happens 2,000 times a year? I will immediately, sorry, very briefly go to it. Uh, their girl gets seduced by Western style of life, wants to live with a Western boyfriend. There is a pressure on the family from her. The girls get desperate. That's what happened over 2,000 times. She seeks refugee with the police. And then the problem is real. What would you have done in this case? If the police protects her, in a way they are totally justified. Her family will say, oh, you're not allowing but our way anyone, of life. No one is disputing that there are problems within either refugee communities, minority communities. The problem is generalizing on that basis. The problem is saying that we should change our attitudes or our opinions about refugees as a whole. No. Simply on the basis no, of some minority practices. No, but you underestimate this. My point is this Maybe one. you overestimate the, No, I'm not saying this is the big problem and so on. I mean, big in the sense of majority. But you, you, you do suggest that there are liberal European values that, for example, example, Muslim refugees from Muslim majority countries don't sign up to. Is that fair? But why is this something uh, problematic? Didn't it show with all those well, it's problematic Islam because you assume problems? Because you're so assuming that there is a monolithic unified group of Muslims and a monolithic unified group of Europeans, non-Muslims, when there aren't. You know, refugees have different this views. This is too simple to Europeans say, yes. have different... What I think we shouldn't be afraid of doing is saying, OK, where should a Western state set a limit. Yeah. What would you do? And I'm asking what your limit is. You're not telling me. Very broad. If it's very broad, then what's the problem? Everyone should get along. I'm confused. And where are the limits that Western European countries or European countries should set that refugees violate in some way in your head? You're not you, telling you, me. I, you tell I me. gave you now one example. One example. Which is the way we understand individual human rights with all our falsities but, and so on. But look at Europe, Slavoj. You know better than me how diverse Europeans yes. are. I mean, the British view of gay marriage is very different to the Polish view of gay marriage. The yes. Hungarian view That's of Jews. Polish people should also be censored. The, I don't have the any The Hungarian problem view with of Jews is very different to the uh, Swedish view I, of Jews. I absolutely the agree. The French view of secularism is very different to the Irish view of secularism. So why are you assuming that there is one European view which these foreign refugees aren't signing up to. I'm, I'm not saying, wait a minute, now you're imputing to you me are, that your word Europe in the book. is a unified Europe and so You, you suggest not. that in your book, you say basically they expect to get the best of the Western welfare state while retaining their specific way of life. I think that in spite of all the differences and so on and so on, there is some minimum of Western notion of human rights, freedoms, equality, and so I'm on. I'm asking what that minimum is that refugees don't meet. You haven't told me yet. No, notions of personal freedom, freedom of choice. Of course, Europe is torn in between, between 
And I, I'm precisely, my true enemies, as it's clear there, are precisely those that you just enumerated. You say you're yeah, the, the far right. You say that they're your true enemies, and then you say stuff like, page six of this book, yes. we are definitely in the midst of the clash of civilizations, Christian West versus radicalized Islam. How is that not the rhetoric of the far right? My answer to clash of civilization is there is a clash within each civilization. There is obvious clash in Europe between. So then why talk of a discredited clash of civilizations? Because it appears in the media as such, but I undermine because you're trying appear to be provocative. No, isn't that the case? No, clash of civilizations. I think is universally seen as a pretty yeah. But provocative again, my statement. God, I said there the true clash is within each civilization. All I'm saying is, do you accept that Marine Le Pen could also say the words, "We are definitely in the midst of the clash of civilizations, Christian West versus radicalized Islam." We can, you can imagine her saying that. Yeah, but she would never add, which is for me part of the same logic that there's a clash. The within. solution of this to this problem is to emphasize the clash within its civilization. You and I'm well aware of this. I was, my God, in Ramallah. I know the big clash now on the West Bank. Uh, my okay. friends, some uh, uh, Palestinian punkers who attack honor killings there. Okay. My dream is to bring okay. together the struggles. You say bring together the struggles. In your book, page 103, you suggest that immigrants, especially refugees, prey on European women because, quote, that what they are doing is foreign to our predominant culture. They are doing it precisely to wound our sensitivities to our predominant culture. They are doing it precisely to wound our sensitivities. How is that not a statement that couldn't come out of the mouth of Marine Le Pen, of the Golden Dawn, of all sorts of horrible groups. Ah, wait a minute. Immigrants as a whole are trying to wound European Not sensitivities. immigrants, those who, who did there. I spoke about the Cologne that. attack. Cologne attack. Okay. And I spoke with people from there. I spoke when I was So you Bala. took an attack and generalized to make a generalized point about no, European no. culture. How is that not bigotry to take a one incident and generalize about people? Wait How is that not what the far wait right Wait a minute. Does? It was absolutely not a sexual attack in the sense of rapes and so on and so on. It was a kind of a provocation, if I may use the word that you use. They, they were, who, the attackers were provoking who? European culture. Seriously, a bunch of drunk thugs. My Arab, Arab friends told me that what happened in Cologne was also happening on Tahrir Square in Egypt. It happens regularly. And what do you extrapolate from that? I'm Nothing. Not, what's your conclusion? Nothing. Some kind but of it also a happens in Germany at the Oktoberfest beer it's festival in Munich. It's it happens at same. Mardi Gras. It's not, why is it not the same? Women get attacked in public places all over the world. Why are you racializing it? Why are you culturalizing it? No, I think you are here absolutely, absolutely simplifying things. You, you are. are just, sorry, Slava, you just said no, to me you it are. happens in Terrier Square and it happens in Cologne. What happens? What is the lesson from Cologne and Terrier Square that you are making that you think is worth making? The lesson that is worth making is that we should talk openly about all these problems and not try to whitewash them and so on and so on. Okay. Uh, isn't uh, it, uh, one, one final question. Isn't it quite navel-gazing, some might say parochial, given the majority, the vast majority of the world's refugees are not in Europe. They're in the Middle East, they're in Africa, they're in the poorest corners of the world. Shouldn't that be the focus of our concerns rather than spurious concerns I about totally agree European with you culture here, being and now undermined? I will really attack back. Okay. Yes, I agree. And what about countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, yeah. and so on? They accept practically zero Points refugees. I made to the Qatari foreign minister on this show. That's Outrageous. a little bit too easy to but, say. But because nobody speaks. But Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, hosting millions of refugees. And here we have European politicians and European intellectuals getting excited about five, ten thousand 10,000 refugees, when the poorest countries in the world are hosting millions of refugees in Pakistan, in Jordan. I my problem, the first of my problems is this one. Why did this even become a crisis of Europe? Why Europe? Yes, why? There are so many other countries. Because why don't refugees go just down to Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Emirates? Why Europe? But why pick on three Gulf states only when there's because plenty rich, of Middle East? Because they are much richer I than agree. Europe. I agree. They should take more refugees. I'm asking you about Europe's refugee crisis. You wrote a book about Europe. And I'm saying, why shouldn't Europe share the burden, the richest continent in the world? Why should it not share the burden of refugees? I, I, where is the problem here? You just said a few minutes ago, why do they all come to Europe? You said it, Slavoj, two minutes yeah, but, ago. But uh, like together with others, in the same way exactly. that the rich Exactly, and the countries Europeans are not sharing the burden. They are, the I'm sorry. No, 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 sorry. Germany, sorry, sorry. Germany sorry. accepted over Syri one million. Germany, yes, but not the rest of it. Syrian refugees make up less than 0.1% of the EU population. In Lebanon, they make up 20% of the population. Know. So I know. please don't say that they are sharing the burden. Mathematically, that is not true. Well, inviting one million people to, the country, to a country who is not close to the... Uh, uh, a region of crisis is quite, uh, is, is something. Well, it's never least. close to the region of crisis. We'll have to leave it there. Slavoj Žižek.
Thank you for coming on Upfront and talking about your book. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.